Thank you so much, Megan. Um, so thanks everyone who stayed with us uh, for this last session of the day, uh, the panel session. Uh, I hope like me, you've enjoyed the three previous sessions, uh, including the, the 50 tips for teams and the six cool new features that Jason LaGreca covered off. I did not think he would get through 50 items and um, he had a very loose interpretation of the number six uh, with 5.5 uh, and then another one afterwards. Um, but there's some really great features coming there, Jason, I'm sure um, there's a lot of excited people uh, to hear about those new features. Um, I highly recommend you probably want to go and review that session once the recording's available, just because there was so much information. I was furiously writing notes. Um, lots of new things that, that I learned on that call. Um, so fantastic. Then we had two uh, follow-up sessions from uh, your academic colleagues, Dr. Magda, Magda Wajak from ECU demoing how she uses Teams and OneNote uh, in a chemistry course environment and in a super lab. Uh, working in hybrid online modes, um, which was really, really great to see. And then we had Dr. Amanda White and Noel Hanna covering how they use Teams and OneNote for their classes, including Digital Inc, um, great insights around, uh, shared around course value rates, which I think is a really important topic to lean into um, as we are trialing out these new um, online and hybrid modes. So without further ado, may I introduce uh, the panel members for today? We have Dr. Amanda White from UTS, Dr. David Kellerman from the University of New South Wales, uh, Dr. Gary Grant uh, from uh, Griffith University, and Sonia Sharp, who is a partner at Ernst and Young. And also, so, panel members, can I hear you all? You can hear. Yes, me. absolutely. Perfect. Fantastic. I can I can see you all as well, and I'm also on the multi screen, so if it, I look like I'm looking away, it's just because I'm going. Um, from screen to screen. So and at the moment, there. we can only see your eyes. Oh, really? Is that better? <laughs> or is it just the background? You, you should be able to see. Up a teeny bit more. All right. So, um, Yay. fantastic. There we go. So first question, well, let's start with you then, Sonia. Um, and thank you so much for attending. So we in higher education can sometimes be a pessimistic bunch. Uh, but in 2021, although things are really tough, it appears that we'll have the largest postgraduate enrolment in the sector in history, perhaps confirming that universities are somewhat counter-cyclical. So my question to you as a partner in one of the big four accountancy firms, what is the value proposition of higher education in 2021 and is it worth it? I think that's a really good question um, and I think the answer is it varies and it depends on what you're delivering and how you're delivering it. Um, so um, everybody's expectations has changed during 2019. The experience of working through COVID, working more remotely, um, uh, whether that um, has shifted our consumer expectations as well as workforce expectations. All of us have done things differently. There's some things that we will never want to go back to. And there's some things that we um, will want to return to, snap back to quickly. Um, uh, and so the offer from universities really, really matters. Um, what we're seeing is that um, social hubs, universities are social hubs, that's still an important function. And certainly for um, your first years, um, critical as they find their way and connect to their peers and to the whole university experience. But probably most important is the way that we approach the, le the learning offer and the learning landscape is critical. Simply transitioning to recorded lectures and allowing people to replay them on their own is simply not enough. We are shifting to a hybrid. We are now hybrid. 80% of organisations we're working with are saying we're going to be hybrid going forward. We ourselves are looking that way. Um, so really working through what does that mean and uh, mean and making it a rich and engaging and exciting experience, whether it's digital, whether it's in person or more often than not, a blend of both is critical. Thank you. Thank you very much. The answer, Sonia. So um, on that note of um, you mentioned the, the hybrid campus um, and hybrid learning. So Amanda, if you're there, uh, what yep. does a hybrid campus mean for you? And and is every university now a hybrid university? 
Yeah, well, I, I came from, well, I do teach at the University of Technology Sydney and we, prior to COVID, were an on-campus bricks and mortar offering only. And you know, for us, hybrid is about offering students flexibility. And I think we're going to see this permanent shift to flexibility. And that's fantastic for accessibility to higher education. It means that higher ed is much more accessible. Um, and for us, you know, especially I teach in a business school, a lot of my students, I have a whole lot of students who are EY graduates right now and enjoying their uh, first few months as EY that's graduates. Fantastic. You know, they're saying, it's about making sure that we're providing work ready graduates, but also with those skills to be able to handle the uncertain workplace. So, you know, there's certain ideas about, you know, unlearning and, and different ways of creating the university experience, but it's flexibility. Hybrid for us is really about providing flexibility to take into account life, uh, COVID, work, and making sure that uh, we can provide that education and that access to education to as many people as we can. So what would you think are the elements that make up the hybrid experience as as separate from a digital experience or an on-campus experience? Well, I think part of that's having the right technology to be able to teach in that hybrid manner. And certainly, you know, hybrid can be some students online getting a certain delivery, some students on campus getting a certain delivery. Sometimes that hybrid is high flex, which is you're doing those things at the same time, uh, which means that we also need to have the right resourcing to be able to teach the way uh, David might with students online and students uh, physically in the classroom is quite difficult as one person. Uh, you've got to be keeping an eye on the chat. You've got to be keeping an eye on what's happening out in the room at the same time. So it certainly does mean an upskilling in terms of academics. Um, but you know, the number one most important thing, and, and this was this came out, and I think today's Campus Morning Mail, and uh, I saw a lot of tweets about it, is that the teacher is so important. So no matter what the technology and the pedagogy, the teacher is really important in creating helping to create that sense of community and that sense of connection, no matter whether we're on campus, off campus, hybrid, high flex, whatever you want to call it, you know, having a great teacher and investing in great educators at, at universities is really important. Thank you. Thank you. That's excellent. And that leads me nicely uh, into my next question, which is to David. So David, um, how will and how should we build the same or how could we go about building the same vibrant communities on the hybrid campus or the digital campus as we've done on the physical campuses? Yeah, it, it's a great question, Thomas, and we can we can even follow up from that question you you drew out about hybrid, which is if we all accept and I think we can the idea that a learning community is one of the most valuable things, which is a body of students who enrich each other's experience. The first thing that hybrid or bimodal makes us think is, oh, you can do the course on campus or online. But the real meaning of, of hybrid is when we collectively enrich the community. So how does an on-campus student enrich the experience of an online student? And more difficultly, how does an online student enrich the experience of a campus student and how does all of this happen seamlessly at the same time throughout a degree? I think that that's a fascinating space that we're going to explore in 2021 because as Amanda just pointed out, we were, we were bricks and mortar campuses in 2019. Our online degrees were like this sort of special, uh, go and do your masters in something, it's an online degree and it was totally separate usually even administered by a separate group of people. In 2020, we became online only universities. And in 2021, we are now exploring what that hybrid space is. It's a fascinating idea where we can think about, for example, laboratories where one student is physically in the lab being facilitated by a second student who is joining at the lab in the laboratory online, who is taking measurements, who's giving guidance to the person who's operating the equipment. And we can see that there's a really exciting interplay between these things. Thank you, that's, that's excellent. So if someone's thinking about 
you know, practically building those communities, what do you think they could take away maybe from today or, or maybe just from um, your experience to start building those communities um, in their institution or for their course or program? Well, I, I think one of the really exciting questions is to do with what is the digital campus? Because if we want to talk about a hybrid experience, we need a concept of a digital campus, which is a space where students can, you know, meet new people in the corridor outside the lecture theatre, but virtually. We create campuses as a space very intentionally where we want students to meet each other to create communities. We want them to see their lecturer, you know, in the queue to get a coffee and, and strike up a conversation. We want academics from different departments to meet up and say, oh, I just saw your seminar last week. Let's write a ARC grant together. All of these incredible happenstance things happen, but it is very intentional. It is why we build campuses the way we do. So not only do we have to understand this idea of how do we build a digital campus, but the second question is how do we hybridize that concept? So a really powerful example of the digital campus, you know, anyone who's listened to me talk knows I'm in favor of getting away from learning management systems as quickly as we can, is because they fundamentally function as content repositories that enable you to access a quiz or access a document. And what we need to build our learning experience on top of is collaboration platforms where people talk and share and collaborate and communicate. We need to wrap that around every single part of the experience. And this is the, the core of what the digital campus is. Then there's this exciting space where we start thinking about things like digital twins and IoT and meeting rooms that are also digital meeting rooms. Now, a lot of campuses will have modern meeting rooms now that you, you invite the room to the meeting and it has a camera. We need to start inviting the laboratory to the lab booking time for the student. We need to start thinking about every object in the campus being mirrored within its digital twin in the digital campus. So there's a lot of very forward thinking concepts, but it's what educational leaders need to start thinking about. Thank you. Thank you. That's excellent. I've just taken a few notes there because I want to follow up about a couple of those points if we've got time later on. Um, so, so question then for Gary, uh, and we'll further digging deep into the hybrid campus, digital campus, hybrid learning. Has, has a move to the hybrid campus and hybrid learning helped or hindered learning opportunities for students in relation to equity, accessibility and disability? That is also a very good question. <laughs> I, I, think it, I think there are two sides to this. Um, we've learned a lot during this experience around what students have access to. Um, I had many assumptions around what sort of technology students were first of all uh, in possession of, how much, how good their internet access was, um, you know, how comfortable they were with using different devices. I have learned a lot. <laughs> um, I've been schooled. Um, from another perspective though, you know, collaboration has been the key word through all of this. Um, I don't think you can build a hybrid campus without collaborating with the people that are getting the product. Uh, it's the students that are our greatest advocates for how we move forward based on this experience, but also they direct us in how we kind of evolve. And, and if we're not really listening to what they're telling us through the student evaluation processes and just general conversations with them, we're probably going to get it wrong. Um, but it, in courses where we have already started adopting a hybrid approach as opposed to an online pre-recorded approach, uh, the feedback has been quite <laughs> unanimous. They want to speak to an expert. They want to collaborate in a digital space with 
a group of people and with an expert. They want to participate in that learning experience. Yes, they're a bit hesitant in the beginning in these in these environments to participate as themselves rather than being anonymous. Um, but as the course evolves, as those deliveries evolve, you kind of see people that you would never see putting up a hand and participating in these activities actually starting to contribute. Mm. So I think, you know, the fact that we're in this sort of digital space for some of these students, it, it makes them more comfortable with the learning environment. And yet we still have about 20% of our students are saying, look, we want to be back on campus. We, we can't wait to be sitting in a chair uh, participating in that forum. So, you know, I, I think the biggest mistake we will make based on these experiences to just shift back into status quo. Um, you know, we're talking about hybrid. It should just be normal. Um, we're talking about collaboration. Well, we have all the tools, both face to face and off campus to collaborate in ways that we've never even dreamed of. And we've also seen people that were so hesitant of engaging with technology, almost becoming quite experts in it and teaching. You know, I, I love tech, I love playing, and yet I bump into someone who wouldn't even touch a device. You know, they wanted a whiteboard marker and an and a overhead projector um, teaching me things that I didn't understand were either in exist in the tools that we're using. So I think it's very exciting. So thank you. There's a few threads uh, to pull on there, I think, Gary. One would be um, your observations around um, the lecture and, uh, well, the, the hybrid delivery um, of what was a lecture and the, uh, the use of the tools and technology to make that interactive as improving the outcomes in terms of participation and satisfaction from a from a student's point of view. So I'm keen with everything you must have read recently about this push from different corners, uh, you know, maybe not from teaching academics, but other corners of the university to, to put content, just you know, record it, put it online, break it into the 15 minute YouTube style blocks. You know, does that worry you? Does that worry you? And what's what's your what's your thoughts on that? Is that going to be good for students? Is that going to be good for the outcomes? Is that going to be good for our mission? You know, based on my experience as an academic over 20 years, I've learned a lot of skills. I've learned a lot of uh, new ways to deliver content. Uh, the reality is, is as a lecturer, you're always on the fly. <laughs> Um, you're always adapting the way you teach to the person or the people in front of you. Um, I've sat down and tried to develop online courses and, you know, I haven't failed at many things, but I failed at that <laughs> because the th I, I want to put too much in for all the different caveats of things that I've already experienced from students and, and, and I can't pull it together. I, I think there are definitely going to be things that I or content areas that can go online. I don't think it's a one size fits all. There are some things that are so dry. Uh, I'm not going to say all those that go online, but you know, there's some things that just should never be a face to face experience. Um, but as for the broader sense of learning, um, it's not about knowledge. Um, it's about the communication, it's the collaboration, it's the innovation, it's the, you know, the and resilience. I mean, I always try to figure out how we're ever going to teach resilience. And I say thank you to COVID because all of a sudden we have a whole bunch of kids that are going to go out um, into the workplace that are far more resilient than ever before and dynamic. I mean, so I think online doesn't deliver that. And we should find niche areas where it works, but you should never prescribe it across a university um, because I, I was going to say that, that's not a pharmacy pun, is it, Gary? <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> Look, it's embedded. <laughs> yeah, no, that that's fantastic. So uh, kind of leads me to, an, to another point and probably one for David. Um, are universities content providers and should they be? So, you know, the fascinating thing that I learnt just this morning was that the word lecture actually comes from the term to read. And before movable type, universities were built around libraries that had vast repositories of knowledge that were in handwritten books of which there were very few copies. And the best way to disseminate this information was for one person to stand up and to read it out to a lecture theater of people who could then all gather this you know, wonderful information. 
And when movable type came along, everyone said the university's dead. People will just get copies of books and learn it themselves. <laughs> and so here we are, you know, hundreds of years later, where we now have YouTube and we have Wikipedia and all of the content is there and people are starting to say universities are dead. Everyone can self learn whatever they want. And it's the same argument that we had when books were invented. It's a it's a wild thought. You know, Gary made the point there. It is not our core value. And in fact, it is not even in the top 10 list of what our values are is to provide content. We've always relied on textbooks. But now what we're able to do is point at myriad of incredible resources. They may be on the web. They may be in our library behind a paywall but they've already been made. And, you know, we, we are not supposed to be the creators of content. We, as teachers, of course, in, in that more classical sense, in the university setting can think of ourselves as like managers of a team. The students are our team and we're there to guide them, to be mentors, to help teach them along a journey and to corral them through this common goal where we're on their side, certainly not standing at a lectern giving two hour monologues, right? Just as much as we shouldn't be recording ourselves doing that and saying, watch this. That is an incredibly valuable thing, but there is, uh, you know, literally a, a, an overload of content at our fingertips today. Fantastic, thank, thank you, David. And, you know, we've been on a, a few calls together, but I still am uh, constantly amazed at the colors um, at your setup, it's just uh, there's so much for the eye to, you know. I could probably it's like watching a fire, you know. You can just, <laughs> just watch it forever. It's it's fantastic. Um, so when we come to or when we think about hybrid learning and we think about some concerns that have been raised about it, there's a lot of issues. It made the press about proctoring and assessment and academic integrity. So uh, probably just starting with you, Amanda. How will we ensure in this hybrid mode that uh, we can actually uh, ascertain that students are capable of what we say they are uh, in terms of, you know, actually assessing them to a standard? Yeah, this is such a, a, a difficult topic because there are so many different factors and forces at play here. Number one, you know, from our own academic perspectives as, a, as an educator, I want to make sure that the students who pass my subject, who go out to EY or to PwC or Deloitte, when they say, yeah, I've done audit, they know how to fill in a work paper. They understand what an assertion is. They understand how to gather evidence. So th those are really important to me as an educator. Um, they're really important so for us intrinsically. They're also important from a professional accreditation and you know university accreditation perspective. Part of what our value proposition is, is we're a quality assuring institution. When you come out with a degree, you're saying, yes, this student has met this level of quality um, and certain uh, you know, graduate attributes and course intended learning outcomes. Also playing into this, uh, especially in my area in accounting, uh, is professional accreditation. So our students will often go on to a Great professional point. qualification. Mm where those professional accreditation bodies say, in some instances, yes, there needs to be invigilation of assessment so we can be sure that those students you know, actually did um, the assessments and can do what we say they can do. And then the other thing that sort of comes over the top of all of that is the financial situation of universities. So right now, you know, there's no institution that's doing fantastically well. Obviously, you know, we're all struggling with uh, the situation with international students um, and we're seeing some declines there and every, you know, every institution's had voluntary redundancies and separations. So quite often you think, okay, well, what is going to be the best way that I can invigilate large numbers of students, especially in, in larger subjects like um, accounting and business subjects like engineering subjects, that is the most cost efficient. So, you know, there's often that, that argument made about cost efficiency and so proctoring comes in as, well, let's take what we did in real exam halls with thousands of students and examiners walking around with their pens, looking over your shoulder and their non squeaky shoes, checking calculators and ID cards. Um, and let's try and replicate that 
in the online environment. And that doesn't always work. Uh, you know, the original accounting software systems basically just paved cow paths rather than thinking, what's the best way of doing this? Let's just take the way that we've always done and just technify it. And um, I think that's a real struggle. So we've moved from this idea of, oh, well, we always had an exam, so let's just keep having an exam. And I think that really comes back to what is authentic assessment? You know, the, the need for authentic assessment. David has this great exam where his students are all doing the exam together mm -hmm. <laughs> and they're chatting to each other. And it's open, and str yeah. Strangely yeah. enough, they're not going, actually, the answer to A is blah, blah, blah. They're smart enough to go, well, you might want to look at this part of the course notebook, um, which is fantastic. Now, of course, interplaying with all of this is intrinsic motivation for why you're doing something. So if you're doing a degree because you really want to do it, those students are like, well, of course, I'm going to study hard because I want to go out into practice and I want to know how to do things so that I can do my job really well. And you have other students who say, oh, well, yeah, my parents are making me do this degree. This degree is a great way to get a residency visa or, you know, whatever the reason is. And so then you have different motivations for coming to university. And even within that academic integrity space, I interviewed a whole lot of students um, and students said, oh, with a really tight job market, I'm forced to cheat because I want to be better than everybody else which blew my mind. Yeah. Yeah. And then on the other side, it was, wow, in this really tight job market, I want to be really good, so I'd better know it. So there's, you know, I don't want to cheat. And so seeing those two different sides means as academics, we need to think about what is the most authentic way that we can assess students? Mm -hmm. What, and invigilation doesn't necessarily mean exam proctoring. Invigilation could be a presentation a student gives, an interactive oral exam, some other type of, task where they might do something and then talk to somebody. So we really need to rethink this idea of invigilation. And uh, if anyone's interested in this, you should really follow Philip Dawson on Twitter. He has um, a lot to say about assessment security. And, you know, a proctored exam isn't a great replication of what an auditor has to do in the workplace. Yeah. But it is a very cost effective way of ensure hopefully ensuring that a lot of students can do what they say they do and you know they're not always foolproof either we had a student who was doing a proctored exam we only knew that that student was cheating because they had a technical issue with the exam then took their phone to take a screen they took a photo of their computer showing the error but also showing all of the notes she had stickied around the outside of <laughs> so <laughs> Sometimes I, I wonder whether there are issues and um, we talked about accessibility and, and other, you know, disability. We know that proctoring solutions aren't great with people who are of, um, you know, people of colour with skin types and, and different uh, issues. So, you know, there's, there's no easy solution <laughs> to the proctoring solution. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the budget pressure really, I think, for a lot of academics feel like, oh, yeah. well, I'd love to do this other task, but it would take me this much to mark it, and in an exam, I can mark them this much quicker. Um, and unfortunately, that financial pressure, mm -hmm. you know, I think uh, comes into a play quite a bit more than we would like to think, even though academics will quite often do a lot of marking and other work for free because I think, oh, well, this is really important. Um, yeah. But, you know, that's a big issue. Yeah, no, thank you. That's a fantastic answer. I think, yeah, the jury is still absolutely out about assessment in the hybrid campus about what good looks like. And I think there's still a lot of people, uh, groups, faculty, schools, really working through what it means for them and working with um, accreditation bodies as well about what they will and won't accept in terms of, um, you know, ensuring accreditation. So thank you so much. Um, of course. Can I just jump in there? Yeah, just please, Sonia, yeah. Because I'm like absolutely. going, yeah. So they're like, so I think it's really interesting, like what is cheating? Um, mm. And, um, but also, you know, like in a world where really we're looking to automate anything that can be automated so that people can really delve in deeply to the biggest conundrums that are facing us, things that cannot be solved 
um, easily. And the kind of people we want to employ are people who are mentally agile, inquiring, um, problem solving, and most importantly, they team around that, that they work together to solve it, that they fail, you know, like, whoa, we've gone down a cul-de-sac and we've got nowhere. Um, and they can come back and they can explore. Um, and actually, the other thing about cheating is if we look at the great advances in technology, you know, there were weak signals way back. Um, and I was listening to one of the great things about working in EY is we have the, we are, we've just a treasure trove for kind of technological creativity. Um, so I'm completely blown away all the time by the stuff that I discover and learn about. But I was listening to somebody yesterday, one of my colleagues, who was talking about explorers, pioneers and early settlers um, and um, in the development and evolution of technology. And the reality is, is we copy stuff and we improve on it. Mm. So do I care about people copying? No, as long yeah. as they improve on it. And as I, long as it's not intellectual property, probably. <laughs> I, I'd love to as share. Long as, they, as long as they acknowledge it and improve yes. on it. David, thank you, little, Sonia. That was great. I'd love to share a little anecdote. So I, I inherited a course that had these um, quizzes in the LMS. And what they do is they automatically generate random numbers that makes every single person's question have different conditions and different answers. They put in their own unique answer and, you know, it automatically marks it. So what my students, of course, did was that they reverse engineered the structure of the questions and made a spreadsheet where you just put in your number at the beginning, it automatically calculates the solutions. You put it in and you get 100% and then shared it within their Facebook group. Oh, and I, I looked at this and I was like, well, great engineering bonus mark. OK, well done, because what you've done is you've solved an, a problem with less effort. And to me, contract cheating is the same thing. If it's easier and cheaper compared to your time to get someone else to do an assignment for you and it's good enough, then great. You're being an effective human in terms of efficacy and the core problem here is the actual tasks we're giving students and it's the word you know amanda used there which is authentic assessment i don't outsource my job right we we outsource all sorts of things at university we outsource the the cleaning and we outsource the building maintenance but there's no way that i can outsource my own job because my job is authentic to me and to who i am even if I wanted to, I couldn't. And we have to make sure that education meets that criteria. Then we don't need proctoring. We don't need to breathe down people's shoulders. The best way to do it is to do it authentically. Mm. So thank you. The worst thing textbooks ever provided was question banks. Mm. <laughs> the worst thing <laughs> in textbooks? That's not a fan from David Amanda. Was talking about. <laughs> you heard it here and it'll be on the record. Um, so, so publishers know that. <laughs> absolutely. So great, great discussion. Love it. So let me put another one to you that I know that yesterday Woolworths announced $50 million to train their internal staff in tech skills. So I'm going to quote um, part of their statement. The key technical focus areas for training will be digital, data analytics, machine learning, robotics, with further investment planned for advanced customer service skills, team leadership, and agile ways of working. So, universities don't actually have a great track record for internal training and skilling up their academic and professional staff. So in relation to capacity building and building skills uh, for the digital age and to succeed in this hybrid environment, what should universities be doing to ensure that they have the right skills, um, capabilities um, to be successful in uh, this new world? And I'd open this to, to anyone. I'd love, love some discussion around this. I'll jump in there because it's, it's, I love it. Um, and interestingly, um, and Woolworths uh, are one of many organisations who are, are doing exactly this, investing in their workforce. EY is one. So every single member, every single one of our 350,000 workforce, uh, we're being encouraged to do um, our MBA tech. 
um, are just enrolled um, and um, and we have a whole series of learning opportunities, rich learning opportunities that we can engage with because we know that this is the future and every single one of us needs to be uh, comfortable with it um, and, and feel familiar with it. And I think for um, to going back to the conversation we had earlier, which is, you know, helping the, the university workforce to adapt and um, really develop their skills and experience so they can be amazingly amazing the best um, in creating a hybrid experience for their students which is stretching and in, in inspiring um, and all the things that we want from a university education or any kind of learning experience so there's a key issue about tools and resources and we have to in, 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 expose and connect in a safe way um, all of our workforce to the opportunities that are available. I mean, actually, Thomas, I mean, I regularly go to the Microsoft, you know, the little YouTube clips about what's in the lab yes. now. I love those because, yeah. you know, when you see what is possible now, again, one of the things I heard from the person who was telling me about um, explorers, pioneers and earlier settlers, he also said, you know, the future is invisible to us. But it's actually happening now and, and that those those in the lab opportunities that just open our minds to what is possible um, and then support us and work with us collaboratively to explore what does that mean and recognise as well one of the things that we do, we do a lot of digital maturity work and digital capability building across organisations and one of the things that we have to be really conscious of is that all of us are at different points of confidence and competence um, and we have to create rich pathways where it's absolutely safe to ask a daft question like the one I asked earlier which is yes. what, what is a tenant I thought it was somebody who lived in a house <laughs> the digital term um, and so when you've got the climate where any of us can speak out and speak safely about not understanding and not knowing and, and get help quickly it's really important but also we need to be exposed and encouraged we need to explore and play and going to David's point we need to be comfortable about exploring and playing alongside our students um, and my biggest digital transformations have come from my youngest team members who are they are my pioneers. They show me the way. No, oh, that's yeah. I'm, I'm I'll write that one down if that's okay. So I'll credit you, of course. <laughs> um, excellent. Um, others, others. Oh, we're, oh, we're doing I, I realized doing I couldn't well. raise my virtual hand, so I raised my actual <laughs> hand. <laughs> I don't know if anyone can see that. Thanks, <laughs> um, I think uh, I'm sure that Gary and David feel exactly like I do that there are not enough hours in the day. Um, it just it feels like we move to online learning, probably not David because he was already on the pathway, but a lot of people feel like they move to online learning as this emergency move. And mm. then they've sort of learnt things just in time, but they're like, I don't know what I don't know. So, you know, but then they think, oh, I say, well, hey, we could do some more training. You could go to a course, you could pick up something. And they're like, well, I'll only go to something when I need it. So there's not this idea, I think, you know, sector wide that, we have a strategic plan of what skills I need to develop, how I'm going to do that. Uh, because if my boss said to me, Amanda, you need to take a master's in higher education, I would just go, well, with what time am I doing that? Um, mm. So I think that workload, managing the workload and managing within our cultures and our workload for ongoing training and continuous professional development in the area of teaching and learning is really important because we're always improving ourselves as researchers. We're going to conferences, we're going to seminars about different research methodologies, we're trying new things. Um, but I think that it feels like at a lot of places, and a lot of people will probably feel the same out there, that the research pressure feels like it's the bigger load on your back than the teaching pressure. Um, and so the workload and, and the culture around CPD, CPE, in terms of teaching and learning, I think, needs to, to change and how you shift a really big ship like a university and a, and a sector like that, I think is is really difficult because I, I wouldn't call universities agile organizations. <laughs> uh, strongly uh, agree. Yeah, that I call individuals itself. agile, but not yeah. institutions as a whole. <laughs> Yeah, I, so I guess one of the challenges then as someone who's had to support both the rock stars like people on this call, for every rock star, Amanda, uh, David and Gary at an institution, there are sometimes more, uh, sometimes senior colleagues who struggle uh, with the technology. 
So, so what can we do to help that? So it's not a crapshoot for students, depending on their course or program about what sort of experience they're having. Could I weigh in just a Absolutely little bit too? Yeah. I, I think I think the training itself has to evolve. Um, I don't know how many training sessions I went to about, let's say, using Teams, for example, that were very didactic. <laughs> it, it was almost like you could have gone back to, like, you know, what, you know, butcher's paper and a pen or, you know, lecture slides. It was almost the same sort of format. The, the training needs to evolve. It, it has to evolve in the same way and demonstrate what we're trying to show people to do. Um, and I think that hasn't yet caught up. We've seen an explosion of training in the last year, yeah, but it's the way in which we train people, but also the facilities that we're building to demonstrate it. And we need to build, I always talk about the beta product of what education should look like. The lecture is not dead, the lecture venue is dead. Um, I think, what does a new lecture venue look like? How much money do you need to invest in it? Is it 150,000 of all this other stuff that is in it? Or is it something quite different? Um, and we need to be able to show and play with that together. So Sonia mentioned about playing, but play pits for staff to explore and experiment live is essential. I, I also think to follow on from Gary's point, um, as, as a lecturer in, let's say the year 2010, you stand up from your office and you walk downstairs and into the lecture theater and you instantly walk into this environment the students are already sitting there the projectors and the lights are on the microphone is on boom the automatic recording started and you just say how's everyone feeling and a couple of people would be like oh we're pretty stressed about our whatever assignment and and boom right it, it's all there and it all happens and we go to the year 2020 in the digital environment and it's as if we're asking every lecturer that they have to hammer their own lecture theater out of bits of scrap timber they found in their backyard mm. we are not digitally provisioning these environments for academics. We've got people with their, their home laptop and a little webcam and starting a Zoom phone call. We need to be provisioning these beautiful digital environments. And I know exactly how to do it. And I know that it requires an investment with seven zeros on the end of it. Now, our deans will be so happy when they gloriously walk out and cut the scissors of their new $10 million building, but we're not cutting the scissors on new $10 million digital assets that provision these incredible environments that our academics can just walk into. It can be done and senior leadership are not making the decisions or the investment to do it. Thank you. So thank you there, David. I think that's a really good one. Uh, we've got a couple of minutes less uh, left, um, but David, I think you 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 probably touched on this already. But um, that that facilities and the space, I think there's a lot of work to be done around getting spaces that are fit for the new world. And and Gary and Amanda and Sonia, I think you all touched on. We do need to invest for that. It's not going to uh, a webcam and a, a a cheap office works mic is not going to. Uh, make the experience what we need it to be um, and a really good point about um, some investment required there. So my final question to you all and uh, just noting we've got two minutes left is um, what would you say to an academic who, who might have joined today, might not have joined today, about to start semester, they'll be teaching in a hybrid mode but they're still nervous, you know, they're not sure how, how many students are going to want to come onto campus because there's still cases going. Um, they're, they're anxious. They're worried about mastering the technology and tools. Um, they really want to do a good job um, running and managing their course and giving the students a great experience. What is your key advice for them? I'll, I'll start, which is students want to be successful. They want to be part of a community. They don't want to cheat and want to not make friends. Now, chances are your students have already started a Facebook group you don't know about. Chances are that 
if you create that environment, they will do the work for you. They'll do amazing things if you build the infrastructure. And if you can implicitly and internally motivate and inspire them to do the hard work themselves, to be inspired by their peers as well as their teacher and to create that community, they're going to do the heavy lifting for you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's excellent and it's being recorded, so we've got it. Thank you. Uh, Amanda, Sonia, Gary. I'll go next. Um, I think, you know, especially when you're trying something new and we are always trying something new, is to be honest with them. Doesn't matter if you muck up, something doesn't work, you accidentally end the, the class by pressing the wrong button, uh, they'll always come back. And the fact that they know you're human helps create some of that connection and that community as well. So be honest with them. Uh, you don't have to pretend like you know everything. Fantastic. Thanks, Amanda. I'm happy to go next. Absolutely. I think I think don't be risk averse. There is no linear script to deliver content and courses and skills. You can be adaptable. And once again, like Amanda saying, collaborate, right? Um, my my origins were in trying to organize and simplify my life. So maybe start with using the tools for your own life because it's about productivity and then move from there and see how it fits in your own um, learning and teaching uh, arsenal. And my last word would be be kind to yourself um, uh, and, um, and play a bit, pause and explore, look around you. YouTube is a great resource for thinking about the kind of extraordinary things that are possible. Reach out to your peers um, uh, and remember that at this moment in time in the kind of hybrid world, we really are all of us in our own way, pioneers, explorers and early settlers. Um, so we're creating a future. And I just go back to what David has said is, is, is allow your students to be your guides and work with them because they are uh, they are they are they're actually they're the explorers we're probably the pioneers and the early settlers <laughs> fantastic thank you sonia i think that's a great way to to finish the panel session uh it was a real privilege to be uh on this uh well to facilitate this panel with you all um absolutely fantastic insights there and um, again this will be shared as a recording for everyone i'm going to hand over now um to Megan Towns to, to bring us home and um, to uh, give you a list of resources and also how to provide feedback. But thank you so much for joining us today and thank you so much to the panel members. Um, it was wonderful and I look forward to working with you, your institutions uh, to a better end than beginning to 2021. Thank you all. Over to you, Megan. Thank you, Thomas. Thanks all. Thank, thank you. you very much. And thank you to Thomas for facilitating today. It's been great to, to have you as a part of today's session. Um, and thanks to all of our uh, panel members as well. That was amazing to watch, actually. I've just been enjoying myself for the last hour. So like any uh, conference or summit, it's always good to take something away. So unfortunately, we can't pass a keep cup through the screen to you, uh, but we can leave behind a few resources for you. So uh, our Microsoft Educator Center has been around uh, for quite some time, uh, but I thought it was worth pointing out that we now have some uh, resources and courses specific to the higher education sector. So if you go to education.microsoft.com, you'll find a lot of generic courses for educators. Uh, but if you search under training and courses and actually write higher education in there, you'll find courses like the one you see on the screen uh, for collaborating faster using Microsoft Teams for education staff, for example. So do check that out. Um, great to facilitate your own uh, learning. Uh, and then finally, another great resource that you might like to check out uh, is the um, education uh, office support page. Uh, where you'll find step-by-step -step instructions on using a number of different tools from across across the Microsoft Education suite of tools. Um, I know a lot of educators like those because it's step-by-step -step instructions with screenshots. Um, so check those ones out at support.office.com forward slash education. We'll pop these in as announcements as well. Um, and then finally, um, what a lot of uh, people don't realize when you either work for an education institution or you attend the institution as uh, a student is that you often qualify 
to download Office for free on up to five devices. So if you're out there about to buy a new device or you're talking to your students who, who might be going down that path of purchasing devices for the year ahead, uh, be sure to check with your institution to find out if um, downloading Office is a part of the Office subscription that your uh, university or, or TAFE has. Uh, all they need to do to check um, whether they are eligible for free Office is go to aka.ms forward slash AU free Office 365. They can pop their university email address in there and see whether they're eligible for that free download of Office onto up to five devices, whether they be old or new. So there's a few takeaways uh, for you. Hopefully that's going to help you out in the year ahead, as well as experiencing all these sessions today. So from all of us at Microsoft and the education team here in Australia, a big thank you for attending. Uh, big thanks to uh, Claire and Chanel in the background, as always, for all the work they've done in making this event come to life. And if you'd like to check out the recordings, we'll have them up on our YouTube channel uh, within the next week or so. And if you have any questions between now or then or even after, please send us an email at oz-edu at microsoft.com. Uh, and stay tuned for an email coming out to those of you who registered for this event, as we'll have all the links and details shared uh, in today's sessions um, shared with you in that email. Thanks, everyone, and we hope you have an amazing 2021.